following the biggest off-season of moves and acquisitions by general manager Howie Roseman. The expectations of this city have never been higher. Welcome to the 2022 Panla Hockey Postgame Show on 6abc.com and across the Jacob Sports YouTube channel, exclusively presented by Panla Hockey Giordano. Live from the Gallery Bar, Booking Games Inside Ocean Casino Resort. Let's get this postgame show underway. E A G L E S Eagles. And good afternoon, everybody. The Eagles are 4-0. and Welcome to the Pond La Hockey Eagles postgame show. I'm Mike Vicinelli with Derek Gunn and Seth Joyner. Devin Caney will join us a little bit later. So through the, the rain and the wind and the muck and the overall nastiness, they survive and they overcome the Jacksonville Jaguars at home, 29-21. to and, and they got five turnovers. I mean, let's face it, in this kind of a game with the weather the way it is, Trevor Lawrence not... Uh, uh, very secure with the football. Uh, they get the five turnovers. They run the ball, which is what they should have done in the weather like this. They ran it straight ahead. Miles Sanders, 27 for 134. 4-0 four for the first time since 2004. And that was the year, of course, number five will always love you. Right, 2004. They went to the Super Bowl that year. <laughs> it, got, it got a little hairy at the end. But Trevor Lawrence gave them the fifth turnover, which secured the victory. Guys, uh, this is the way it, it really should have played out in this kind of weather. It, it, it didn't look like they were going to do it early, but finally they got their bearings on running the football the way they should have. Well, we jokingly said once, once things were going bad for them early on, all they had to do was get to the second quarter because that's where they seemed to do their most damage. You know, both of these teams came into this game turning the ball over one time. But when you look at the sloppy conditions today, you knew the elements were going to play a significant factor in the outcome of this game. Early on, it played in favor of Jacksonville with a ricochet interception that was returned for a touchdown. But lo and behold, you know, the, 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 the football gods turned in favor of the Eagles and gave them five turnovers today. And, man, they needed it today. But um, you got to learn how to win in, in every kind of condition. And we watched this team put together four different types of win this season. You know, this thing could have went a myriad of different ways. Um, but it's funny because, you know, while we're watching the game, I'm watching this thing unfold. You get the tip interception, pick six. Then they turn around, they drive down, they punch it in, it's 14 to nothing. And I tweet right then and there and say, hey, listen, the Eagles for the first time this season are facing adversity. Let's see how they respond. If you're Eagles fans, you got to be excited about what you saw today because this team was in the hole two touchdowns and clawed their way out and scratched out a win in the game under really adverse conditions. I mean, there was opportunities for the offense to just lay down. Hurts, you know, didn't throw the ball particularly well today, but when he needed to make plays, he made plays. Um, Miles Sanders got a workload like we haven't seen Miles Sanders get in a long time. And Derek, I said in pregame, I said he may have to run the ball 25 Absolutely. times for them Absolutely. to be successful today. He ran the ball, what, 22 27. times? 27 times. Yeah. Um, let me get the numbers yeah, tw here. Yeah, tw 27 for uh, buck 34. Buck 34 two yeah. touchdowns. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, that's, that's, that's pretty darn big, you know, yeah. when, when, you, when you don't put that kind of workload, you know, on your running back. But, I mean, listen, if you're an Eagles fan, you got to be thrilled with where this team is. They're undefeated right now. But Seth, I, I tell you, this was a classic example of the Eagles' offensive line being superior to a pretty good Jacksonville defensive front. The Jags are pretty good against the run. They're number one in DVOA, if you, you follow those kind of analytics coming into the game. And they lost two guys, and they had, so they had to put Driscoll in there, they put a Opeta in there, and they still survived it. Well, it, wasn't, it was never a situation where you had to put – Driscoll or Petta in a situation where they had to kick, you know, 40 times in order for you to get back in the game. They were down early, which lent to them being able to run the football, continue to run the football, stick to their game plan, which I'm sure that game plan adjusted just this morning. I mean, when you get to the stadium and you realize that the weather's going to be the way that it is, listen, you're not going to come out and have Jalen Hurts throw the ball 30, 35 times today. So because they got behind early, that, that gave them the, 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 the ability to just continue to run the ball and stick to the game plan and only have Jalen throw the ball when they need to have him throw. 
four of their turnovers lead to, to 30 points, by the way. So every time that the Jacksonville Jags turned it over, the Eagles answered with a score, three touchdowns, and they got the field goal there. They scored 20 straight points off of turnovers in, in a span there. And, you know, Derek, you brought up the second quarter. You ready for this? They're 85-14 and 14 in the second quarters this year against their opponent, 44 and to zero in the last two. So something's kicking in in the second quarter for this team. What's that all about? You know what? They, they have to make adjustments. They're adjusting to what a defense is throwing at them. They go over to the sideline. They talk about it. They adjust their game plan. And once they adjust their game plan, a defense is unable to counter with it because of all the weapons this team has in the passing game and the running game. This particular game, they started out trying to run to the outside against this Jacksonville defense, and Seth and I are screaming, you can't run to the outside against this defense. They're too fast. Run straight at their defense. Once they start making that adjustment, they were starting to hit them right up the middle. That's when they started gaining chunks of real estate. Give Shane Steichen and Nick Sirianni credit once again, making adjustments on the fly that turned out to be so beneficial to the success of this team today. Uh, Trevor Lawrence, let's talk about him because I like him. I, I think he's going to be a really good player in this league. But today, I think, proves not ready for, for adverse conditions, not ready for prime time. Got a little skittish there. Lost two snaps. Got strip sacked twice. Got, got baited into an interception by Bradbury on pressure from Gannon on that play. Well, I, I will continue to contend. I will die on two hills. One of them is, you know, even in today's world of the quarterback-driven NFL, you still need a running game. Most quarterbacks in the league still need a running game in order for them to be successful. The other hill I will die on is the hill of pressure. Pressure changes everything. Pressure makes pipes burst. Pressure makes quarterbacks make hasty, dumb decisions. They make them make mistakes. And when you sit back and you let a quarterback in this league, at this level, just feel comfortable in the pocket, go through his reads and have options of where to throw the ball, you're asking for trouble. Now, the Eagles got to Trevor Lawrence, and they made him uncomfortable. They even, at times, made it look like they were coming, and just the illusion of pressure made him nervous. Um, the Eagles only dra they, they only blitzed three times a day. Just three. I mean, in my estimation, that's not enough because – Listen, you allowed Trevor Lawrence in the second half to get comfortable and pull within, you know, shouting range of tying this game up and send him to overtime. Why? Why not just decimate his confidence from the beginning? Why not just do it the entire game? Why not leave any shadow of a doubt that, you know what, you have no chance? The Eagles are going to get themselves in trouble because they're going to do this with a quarterback down the road, and it's going to come back to bite them in the behind. I'm telling you right now. Well, we'll see if, if that happens. Now, I thought it was really but First of all, welcome back to Doug Peterson. He got a nice ovation. They put him on the, on the board, got a really nice ovation. I thought that would happen. He's won a Super Bowl here. I think Eagle fans really respect that. But I think he tipped his hand with Trevor Larson. There was that one series. They were third and ten, and he ran the football to just give it up to, to punt. At not trusting his quarterback in that kind of situation. I think Doug realizes he's not a finished product yet. Well, he's not a finished product, but, you know, as a coach, I think coaches need to do a, a much better job of taking the temperature of what's going on around their team and, and what's going on in the moment. I always talk about the analytics drive so much in professional sports now that it's ridiculous. The analytics have all, always been created to be a tool used by the coaches when they're making decisions. It's not a tool that should drive the decisions I of coaches. Analytics. I hate analytics. And, and, and it, well, listen, it, it's a part of the game. It and, is. And, and people think that analytics is something that was just came out of nowhere. Listen, it was analytics when I played. You know, because we didn't have computers and computer printouts back then, you created your own analytics. Guess why? By, by how? By watching film and charting teams over a four-game span. Those are analytics, okay? The probabilities of analytics is what's making the, the, the decisions for coaches nowadays. Yes. And to me, that's a problem because you lose accountability. Because if the numbers say the probability of you winning the game go up if you convert this fourth down and you go for it, if, if I'm the coach, I'm like, don't look at me. Your analytics guy up there is in my ear telling me to go for it because this is what the numbers say. 
you know, so there's no accountability. That's the first thing. The second thing is whatever happens to your gut. Okay? The feel for I the game. Yes, I yes. watched Seattle. I watched Seattle fall apart as an organization because they allowed the analytics to make a decision that cost them a Super Bowl and it destroyed that football team. Yes. Whatever happened to the feel for the game? You talked about there was analytics back when you played, but there were no computers to justify the analytics. Right. That was when coaches had a feel for the game. It was more of a mind game then. You didn't worry about a computer calling the plays for you nowadays. It hasn't happened to the Eagles yet, but I've seen it happen to other coaches, both at the college level and the pro level. You hesitate so much in terms of making a decision, you have to waste your time out. You're indecisive sometimes. You know, luckily the stuff is paying off for the Eagles right now, but, you know, that's why I say I hate analytics. You know, so many teams <laughs> rely on robotic decisions now more so than the physical feel for the game. But, d Gun, listen, yeah. it, it's, not like, it's not like these coaches – they don't have it's not like they don't have that pit in their stomach, Mike, where in a situation they know better. There's something inside. Listen, when you play the game and you coach the game long enough, situationally, you know on the inside what you should do and the decision you should make. But when you got that guy in your ear and the owner's paying that guy millions of yes, dollars, yes. and you make a decision that goes against that and it works against you. The realization of what you're going to face come Tuesday looms large in your decision making, and I think that's a fault. Uh, every every team has the analytics master up there. Now that, let's look at the Eagles converted a couple of really key fourth downs. Now a lot of that was influenced by the fact that the weather kind of they were afraid to kick it with the weather. I, I get that, but they did convert that. I, what I thought turned the game around: the Jaguars on a fourth and three, Lawrence fumbled a snap. They were up fourteen nothing at the time, and that gave the Eagles life. They came down and scored off of that drop. And if he doesn't fumble that ball, he certainly either is running for the first down or he's got a guy wide open in the flat to convert the first down. I mean, that was a huge play in the game. Yeah, and then they, after they gave it up on third and ten, that prompted the Eagles to come right down the field and score again with Sanders to tie the game. And then he fumbles another snap. Reddick with this with the strip sack, he had two of them today, led to another touchdown. All of a sudden you look up, it's 20 to 14 completely flipped. The Jaguars did not look like a confident team after that. Well, when you look at the two strip sacks that Reddick have, let's give credit where credit is due. The guys on the back end holding up in that situation because Trevor Lawrence held the ball longer than he wanted to. Those were both timing situations. He had nobody open, and that one fraction of a second was the difference from him either completing it, throwing it out of bounds, or luckily for the Eagles, them stripping the ball getting the ball in their favor on a short field, which led to them getting a couple of scores. So kudos to the guys in the back end as well for being able to hold up their end of the bargain today. And hey, Mike, can, yes, can, yes, sir. And can I put this to, bet, to rest before you ask me this question okay. later on? Here we I'm, go. And before everybody I'm, I'm a, on social media asks the question, uh, is the Eagles defense that good or is, it, or is Trevor Lawrence just that bad? Come on, man. I'm going to tell everybody the same way I told you last week. You play who you play, and I'm not going to absolve the great player. This defense, I'm not going to take it away from them with the, with the response, is that, oh, it's, it's Kirk Cousins, and he stinks. Oh, it's Carson Wentz, you know, and he's fried. Oh, it's Trevor Lawrence, and he's a young quarterback. Listen, it's the pressure that this defense applied to these quarterbacks, okay, that caused them to make the mistakes that they made and the Eagles capitalized on it, and that's why they're 4-0 right now. I'm not going to take it away from right, them right. By, by saying that these quarterbacks and these teams that they're playing are that bad. No, they're forcing the issue. I'm totally with you there. I, I think Trevor Lawrence is going to be a good quarterback. I think he got a little nervous today under these conditions. I don't know how many, how many conditions were like that ever that he played down at Clemson, right? But, uh, yeah, listen, they are what they are. They're 4-0 right now, and, and there's nobody that can complain about that. I have one complaint, however. There was one thing that stuck out to me, and uh, it was A.J. Brown and a lack of effort to tackle the interceptor after that play. I mean, he was right there to line him up, and, and he just they did not want to engage. That bugged me a little bit, Seth. Had to bug you. It did, and I'm pretty sure, you know, he's not looking forward to rolling into the – to the film room tomorrow and having to watch that on film with his teammates, with his offensive teammates sitting there watching that lack of, of effort. And he'll probably apologize to the guys because, you know what, as a leader on the team, when you don't live up to that standard, 
you know, that Jalen Hurts is always talking about, and that's standard right. that Brandon Graham is talking about, right. and that's standard that Jason Kelsey is talking about, and you're supposed to be one of the leaders, you got to you gotta own that. You got to own that because that could have been the difference between them winning and losing this football game today. Yeah, it was blatantly obvious. We, we, we looked at it. Well, I mean, he made that. a business decision. He made a decision because, look, <laughs> It's early in the game. You know, I'm already soaking wet. I'm not, no, I'm not putting on, myself out there right now. I, I, I can't there. have that. Two things I want to leave. You know, the Jags came in leading the NFL in turnover margins. They were plus seven coming into this game. Well, the Eagles really flipped it on them there. And and also, Seth, I got I to say, Trevor Lawrence coming into this game had gotten the ball out of his hands quicker than any quarterback in the NFL. 2.39 seconds, they utilized the short passing right. game. What did the Eagles do to take that away? Well, I, I can't say that they got up and they really challenged him. I think he was just confused where he wanted to go with the ball. Listen, Zay Jones is out, so that messes up some of the continuity, you know, at the wide receiver position. And then, you know, we're in a situation where our starting slot corner, and after the first series, our best cornerback is out of the game. You would think that they would be in a prime position to be able to do what they've been doing all along. Um, I just think that Trevor Lawrence had one of those days today where he wasn't seeing the field as clearly as he has been seeing it. And I think the pressure or the or the the, the, the anticipation of the pressure based upon what he watched last week when they bagged Carson Wentz nine times, that's got to have a psychological effect on you when you watch that. So maybe if I'm Doug Peterson, I don't even show him that film. I show him the previous three. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna. I'm still gonna give the, the the secondary a lot of credit for Trevor Lawrence not being oh, yes. Trevor Lawrence today. Yes. I mean, I'm being you know. facetious. No, I know you are. I know you are. <laughs> but you know, when you consider how many times he stood back there and double tapped that ball, it's because he couldn't find anybody downfield. Even when Darius Slay went out, whoever came in, Josiah Scott, whoever came in, held up their end of the bargain in in un, unenviable situations like that. You're right. Jacksonville not having Zay Jones was huge in terms of not being as fluid as they wanted to be with their offensive right. concepts in the passing game. But the bottom line is they had some players out there that could take advantage of situations. Christian Kirk, you know, we all laughed at them signing a Christian Kirk before this season for the kind of money they signed him to. He's turned out to be a really good ball player for him. Evan Ingram, his biggest problem when he was with the Giants was he couldn't stay healthy. He's turned out to be a reliable, reliable receiver for him. They bring in a brand new shirt. You know, they have a pretty good team. They just have to learn how to get over the hump in big games like this. Well, on that note with the secondary, too, Maddox was out, and, and then Slay goes out. So you're talking yes. about Epson, Jos Josiah Scott yes. having, having filled the bill. Now, Scott had his moments of, uh, uh, you know, inglorious moments. But for the most part, they, you're right. They, they did survive it. Well, when you talk about a kid like Scott, he hasn't had much playing time. So, you know, he's out there, his head swimming, his heart's in his throat, you know. He's got a lot of stuff going through his mind, but luckily he has an umbrella of players around him that can help him disguise whatever deficiencies he had on the football field. And the way they were controlling that line of scrimmage, especially in the, uh, from the second quarter on, it made his job a lot much easier. And once the Eagles bounced back, took the lead, they could play a little bit more looser brand of football. All right, much more to come on the uh, Pinewood Hockey Eagles postgame show. We're going to hear from Lane Johnson. Uh, coming up, and also Devin Caney and the Diamond Debate. We'll have all that, game balls, all that stuff. Stay right with us. It is the uh, Pond Lee Hockey Eagles postgame show back after this. At Pond Lee Hockey, we've recovered billions of dollars for our clients, and we're confident we can do the same for you. With over 250 years of combined courtroom experience, we've helped over 100,000 injured clients obtain some of the largest settlements in Pennsylvania. One conversation is all it takes to help you and your family get back on track. If you've been injured in an accident, give Pond Lee Hockey a call. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire?